Harvest Time Church. This is Alyssa. Welcome to The Secretary. Here we will dive into the nitty gritty discussions about God and how to live a real life. I am Alyssa Toms, a secretary from Harvest Time Church in Wisconsin. With my desk sitting in the middle of the office, I get to be a part of the pastor's eureka moments and amazing discussions. But only a portion makes it into the sermon on Sunday. I want to bring you into my world of being in the crossroads of these amazing conversations. Hello and welcome to the Secretary Podcast. Today I have Allison Amelsey. She's the children's pastor at Harvest Time Church in Eau Claire. Uh, A couple things about her. She is married to a wonderful man named Rob, who's a gunsmith, pow, pow, and has three amazing kids. It's kind of funny. She knows so much. We always go to her with a bunch of things. So her nickname around the office is Google. And you'll probably end up seeing that throughout this episode. She just, she tends to know like these really weird tidbit things that no one would really know. And I don't understand how she knows it. Because I Google it. <laughs> Google Google's it Googling stuff. But she does. She knows these weird things. And so whenever we have like these weird legal things or just random questions, she usually knows the answer, which is it's really fun on our end. And you can test her. I I can guarantee you come up to her and ask her something. She'll you know, if it's weird enough, she'll probably know it. And I also think it has something to do, we'll kinda of get into this later, but she has kind of like a myriad of jobs under her belt. And every time I talk to her, she's like, oh yeah, one time I worked in a makeup place. It's always just like this random thing. I'm like, what are you, what do you, like, where haven't you worked? She's just worked so many places and has just all this plethora of knowledge. At Harvest Time, you know, I did say she was a children's pastor, but she also leads our HTCU classes, including Discovery class. She just took that on and just ran with it. And now it's this um, Discovery class is the class that you need to take to learn more about Harvest Time, more about your faith, and more about like your spiritual giftings, as well as the class you need to take to become a member at Harvest Time. A couple of things I like about how she likes to dance. I remember we did a refit class and she was like full bore into it. And I really appreciate her. Personally, she's like a really great mentor of mine. I often find myself at least once a week going into her office and we talk about life things and she usually guides me in things that, um, like kind of like a big sister. She's a very, she's very much a big sister to all of us in the office and probably like a daughter to pastor Kim. So we're all family here, but she is like a sister to me and I look up to her a lot. So Allison, I'm really Thanks, happy to friend. have you here. Aww. Well, that was a good podcast. Let's be done. Just <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Done. <laughs> but we have so much more to tell you. So no, we're not done. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just kind of jump right into it unless you have something to say about, no, Anything? I mean, you kind of covered it. I've got kids, I've got a husband, and I know a lot of weird knowledge. What's your favorite stuff. place on earth? My favorite place on earth, Disney World. I knew it. Yeah. I, was, oh, yeah. I just didn't want to, I didn't want I to mean, say it for you. We're kind of Disney people. Yeah. A little bit. How many Mickey Mouse ears do you own? None. What? Well, my kids own them. Okay. All of my kids have them, but I have this problem with Mickey ears because they're like $35 for Mickey ears. And when I'm at Disney, I really want Mickey ears, but there's a lot of them and I can't pick which one I want. And then as soon as I take it off like the rack and I go to buy it, I go, I will only wear this at Disney World because I'm not going to wear Mickey ears around town. Like I'm not going to go to Target in my Mickey ears. And so I then wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> I always put it back and then I buy a sweatshirt every year. It happens every year. I did wear Mickey ears. This year, though, I borrowed my middle child's and I wore them as soon as service was over because that was when my vacation started. I remember. So after second service, I put on my Mickey ears and I was like walking around the church and people were laughing at me. But I was like, I'm going to Disney World. I'm wearing my Mickey ears. That was your symbol to the world. You're like, I'm done. I'm going. I know I felt really good for you. I'm out. Yeah, it was good. It was was a good trip. I'm glad you went. Yeah, it was super fun. Not that I actually know anything about it besides what you told me, but it's a good trip. It was a good (laughs) one. It was a good trip. It was relaxing. I don't take my phone with me, so I like completely disconnect. Uh, So that's really cool. No Facebook, no Instagram. That's a thing with pastors specifically. You guys get your phones blown up when you're on vacation. So it's really good that you leave it behind. So I leave it alone. And you don't, it's really good mentally. It's just good. Anyway. It is. Well, welcome back. Cause that was just like a week or two ago. Yeah. Just, yeah. A week ago we got back. So it was great. It Good. was fun. So I guess the first question would be how long have you been in children's ministry as far as leading it? Like places you've worked before and even before kids ministry, like those, those other jobs I was telling you about, do you have like a list of those as well that led up yeah. to kids ministry? I have been 
actually working in kids ministry since I was 16. So when I was 16 years old, there was a program at our church called Missionettes or Impact. And I had done that as a child growing up and I completed actually the highest level that you can complete in Missionettes is called the Esther Award. And so I had completed that. And then I actually went back and was co-teaching with one of the adult teachers who wasn't super confident in the curriculum itself. And I had done it all. So she kind of did all the prep work, but I did the teaching stuff. And that was like third and fourth grade girls. And I was like 16 years old. So I served every Wednesday night in that. And then when I graduated high school, I actually went to work with teenagers. I wasn't planning on working with kids. And I was working with teenagers who were um, on drugs, gangs, that sort of thing. They were what we call troubled teens. And I worked at a group home and I did a million things there. And that's part of the reason why I have like 8 billion jobs. I was... um, in charge of one of the homes. So I had girls who lived with me, like six or seven girls lived with me at a time who were all teenagers. And I was like 19, 20. I wasn't much older than them. It was really fun. And then at the same time, that group home was affiliated with a church. And so I was the worship leader at that church. And then all of the staff kids who their parents worked at the group home, I homeschooled their kids during the day. So I homeschooled and then I worked in children's ministry there. And I was the youth pastor there. And I worked in accounting there. That was all at (laughs) once? Yeah. So over a period of like six years, I did that. Uh, It was really neat. And so it was really busy. And I did a lot of things there. But while I was there, it was a Christian group home. And one of the things that kept coming up was the teenagers would all say, I grew up in the church and I went to school, Sunday school and I went to children's church, but God wasn't real. It was just a bunch of stories. And it really frustrated me because God was very real to me as a kid. And I experienced God as a kid more than just through Bible stories. Can you say like an example how? Sure. So I was nine years old and I, my mom was in the church choir and they had choir practice every Sunday night at 530. And I was coming to church with her because I wanted to go to church that night. I loved being in church, so it didn't matter. I would go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I wanted to be at church all the time. And she had choir practice at 5.30, so I got there. And I remember running into the senior pastor at the time, and he was like, oh, well, there is no church tonight. We don't have church tonight. It's just choir practice. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. So I went into the sanctuary by myself at nine years old, and I kind of sat in like the back couple of rows. And I remember just that day, something had happened that I felt like people weren't understanding me. They weren't understanding what I was saying. And I just felt like as a little kid, sometimes you have a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas and you don't convey them correctly. And so there's misunderstandings and all this kind of stuff. And I sat down in the pew and I just started talking to God. And I was like, God, I really want people to understand me and I want to understand others. And I just, I don't know, I just want you to speak to me and I want to be able to just know how to talk to people. And I was nine and I remember standing up. And as I stood up, I really strongly felt the Holy Spirit say First Kings 3.11. And I was like, oh, that's weird. And I started to walk away and I like felt it again. So I sat down and I opened up my Bible and it was First Kings 3.11. And it was when um, God says to Solomon, what do you want? You can ask for anything and I'll give it to you. And Solomon says, I want understanding and knowledge and wisdom to know how to lead and guide your people. And at nine years old, it was the very first time that I knew God had specifically spoken to me about a prayer that I had prayed. And I was like, cool. And I really didn't think anything of it until on the way home, I told my mom what happened. And she was like, what? She's like, that's crazy. She's like, there's adults that that's never happened to. And it was kind of at that moment that I very well knew that God speaks to me as a kid. And it's stayed with me like my whole life. So as I got older and I saw these teenagers who were like, God wasn't real to me as a kid. He was a story. I looked at the guy who was in charge of the group home and I was like, I'm going to put you out of business. That's my new goal. We have got to have kids who understand that God loves them and that he's real and they can experience his power so that they won't walk away when they get older. And at the same time, I had a couple of friends who were stay-at-home moms there that had really young kids and they you know, were 
low income. They had, you know, their husbands worked, they had one car. And so they were home with their kids all day long. And on Sundays they would come to church, like fully decked out, like they were dressed up and everything. And then they would be sitting in the back room with their kids because there was no kids in ministry at the time. So one Sunday I just was like, Hey, can I, can I watch your kids? And it started with three kids and then it was 15 kids and then it was 40 kids. And there was nothing. I mean, we didn't, I didn't know what I was doing other than I loved kids and I liked hanging out with them. And so every Sunday I would just open up the Bible and just talk and teach them. Didn't have a budget, didn't have anything. And it was so cool. And I was a worship leader at the time. So all the kids would stay in the service during worship. So they would come and they would stand right by the keyboard and they would just experience worship. And then we'd go and we'd talk about the Bible and it was just really fun. And that's kind of how I started in kids ministry, just realizing that there was a need. And if we wanted people to grow up to be followers of Jesus Christ, that we had to teach them when they were young, that they could experience God tangibly in a real and tangible way. I know that you even continue that now. And that was, you know, that, that from the starting, you knew what they needed to know until even as you're doing it, like now, as you've been kind of seasoned into it, um, you still like that you, you still start with like these fundamental truths that you're trying to ingrain in these kids as well as uh, building on that. And that's kind of what I want to talk about next with your current goal for kids ministry, which is we talked a little bit about the fundamental truths, but also you have kind of a unique program because you work very closely with Pastor Kyle, who's our youth pastor. So you've come up with like a plan from birth until adulthood, just get walking them through their faith so that they are strong and secure in it, which is really cool to see you guys work together because you do base your curriculum on what the other person is going to teach. Could you explain a little bit about how does curriculum change based on age level and how that benefits the kids, what you kind of teach them as they're younger and then how that changes and morphs as they get older and how you build on those small blocks to make them something like a building or I guess a, a tree. You know? Yeah. So we, we start in preschool. Our formal curriculum actually starts at age two. And we use a curriculum called First Look that has three basic truths that we want every kid to know by the time they're five. And that's God made me, God loves me, and Jesus wants to be my friend forever. And I always say to our volunteers and to our parents, I'm like, how would your life have changed if you understood those three basic truths from the time you were born till you were five? Like if that was ingrained in you, God made me, God loves me, Jesus wants to be my friend forever. Those are things we want our kids to know, believe, and walk in. And then when they get into kindergarten, our services change from a classroom setting to a church service setting. One of the big pitfalls that we see in kids' ministry versus... Uh, Sunday school, which I don't have any problem with Sunday school. It's just not something that we do here. We notice that kids have a hard time transitioning into church because they haven't experienced worship. They haven't experienced those kind of elements. So we make kids church, kids church. So we have our own worship. We have offering time. We have a message time. It's just done in a way that's kid appropriate. So it's fun. It's interactive. It's very hands-on. And we go through on Sunday mornings, a three-year scope and sequence of the entire Bible. And so what that means is when a kid comes in in kindergarten, they're going to go through the Bible within those three years. So by the time they finish second grade, they'll have gone through the entire Bible and then they'll go through it again before they get into sixth grade. So essentially by the time a kid has gone into youth group, they should have gone through the entire Bible twice. And that's after you know the formative years of two, three, four, five, where they are getting foundational Bible stories that have their own three-year scope and sequence. So in an age-appropriate level, each kid, by the time they get into youth group, should have gone through the entire Bible three times, just in a different age bracket. Um, and they learn in different ways. And so it's, it's really neat and it's really fun. We incorporate not only games and fun activities, but I was just talking last night with our kids and I say to them, you know, we have a lot of fun but my, my primary goal is not to come and have fun with you guys. My primary goal is to teach you about Jesus and we have fun doing it because I only have an hour or an hour and a half each week and we want to make sure that we are in the Word and teaching them how to hear from the Holy Spirit. So at the end of every service, we have worship times where we encourage them to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, whether they do that through vocal worship or they're writing and journaling what God is saying to them or they grab a Bible and they look in the Bible for scriptures and just be led by the Holy Spirit like I was when I was nine years old. And so we have that every single Wednesday and every single Sunday, just giving our kids time to hear from the Holy Spirit because they can come and they can hear a message from me. And that's great. And that's wonderful. But the Holy Spirit's with them at midnight in the middle of a nightmare. And the Holy Spirit's with them at two o'clock on the playground at school. I'm not. 
they need to know how to call on the voice of the Holy Spirit without me. So we practice that on Sunday morning. We practice that on Wednesday nights, showing them how to do that. And then we have a program called Nights, which is my fourth and fifth grade student leaders, which I started about 10 years ago when I got here. And they do everything. I mean, they learn how to do worship. They learn how to do tech. They lead small groups. They learn how to set up and clean up from service. And it's all about learning how to serve like Jesus served. And he put others first. He came to serve others, not to seek his own glory. And we see that so much through scripture. So we talk that through. We do Bible studies together, scripture memorization. Nights is a fundamental program that we have for our fourth and fifth graders. And that really feeds into our youth ministry. And it's fun now because where we're at, Kyle and I have both been here 10 years, and we're really starting to see the benefit of those who have come in kids ministry and then experienced nights and kind of how that's influencing the youth ministry. It's really fun to watch. We just had our youth Sunday last Sunday. And It was really emotional for me to look and watch kids who used to be on our kids' worship team now leading in adult worship, and it's neat to see that that growth, and it takes a really long time, but it's really cool. I couldn't believe how talented we, like how many talented kids we have. I was thinking, and maybe maybe I shouldn't be comparing, but I'm like, what other churches have this much talent in their youth, but maybe I'm just being prideful, but I just kept thinking, I'm like, how can, I mean, I you, you wouldn't believe it. People were, many people were leading sections of song. Like there's not just like two good singers. There's like really great singers and they're artistic. They can paint, they can, you know, dance. They, they see the vision too, that you guys, you and Kyle have been kind of instilling with like using their creative mode, not just the way we think showing our faith should look, but doing it in a way that actually speaks to their age group for one. Like there's going to be people watching those videos that are their age, not perhaps maybe going to like a general choir concert. Like that's a little bit old school. Whereas this is like, Hey, we have three different layouts of how we're going to do singing and they're all going to be different and they're all going to be a little bit modern so that we can speak to our generation. Right. Um, But that's youth, but also kids. Like I know, like with the Christmas program, it's a pretty incredible experience and it's not just one way of doing thing. There isn't like, only choir or abandoned choir in a sermon. There's tons of different elements that make up that program to outreach to others and show the love of Jesus, not in the way you would expect it. Well, and the other thing we do every year in the Knights program and in youth programs and and the Christmas program is we go, who do we have? And what are the gifts of these kids? We had one year in Knights where my kids were awesome and they really wanted to do something for the Christmas program, but they didn't want to be seen. Like they didn't want to be seen on stage. They, They were we're like, we're not, we don't want our faces really seen. So we did a black light and it was awesome because they felt really expressive and they were able to be creative, but they didn't want to be the center of attention. And so the black light just allowed them to just show an item, not themselves. And so that was really cool. The other thing too, that I loved about this last Sunday specifically is one thing that we look for is what are the kids gifted at? And we don't make people, and this I say we because I speak for Kyle as well, we never make kids do something that's not who they are. Pastor Kim gives that illustration a lot about, you know, if you tell a fish its whole life that it's supposed to be a bird, it's going to think it's a failure because it can't climb a tree. But if you allow a fish to be a fish, it's going to grow and it's going to thrive and it's going to do great things. And Some of our kids are fish and some of them are birds. They do different things. Not all of our kids want to sing. Not all of our kids want to dance and not all of our kids want to be seen. And on Sunday, you can speak to this. There were kids in the sound booth with you. You know, there were teenagers who were in the sound booth helping with the computer or helping with the sound or helping with the lights. And those same teenagers used to work in my sound booth downstairs. And that's why we actually have all the same sound equipment amongst each of the different rooms. So we have the same soundboard and the same pro presenter techniques that the youth have and that the upstairs has so that our, as our kids grow and learn, we teach them in fifth grade and then they use it in youth and then they're able to streamline into what you're doing too. So even there's the ones that we saw on Sunday, but the ones that we didn't see that were using their giftings because that's what God has called them to do and providing opportunity for them to do anything, whatever it is, whether it's make a bowl or work the tech booth or whatever that looks like. Yeah, that was really cool. And I do have to tell you, I, side note, I'm scheduling both of those people in the booth with me. And I was just thinking how you guys set everybody up. Like that wasn't the case when I came into the tech booth uh, six years ago or something. It was, it was very much like one or two people, but with the growth of technology, it definitely needs more. And those kids were really good. So thank you. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you can thank Kyle because he's really the tech person and I literally show them how to point and click, but it's, it's neat to watch, you know, with our fourth and fifth graders, they're so tech savvy anyway. And so just teaching them how to use ProPresenter and then they think they're so awesome because they're able to be in the sound booth. Controlling the service. Yeah, and it's so cool. But at the same time, it requires so much attention on their part. They have to pay attention to every single thing that's going on because they don't want to miss a cue or, you know, a part of the message. And it's so neat when you see a kid who's quiet and shy and doesn't want to be out in the public eye. And then all of a sudden you put them in the sound booth and they're like, I was made for this. And then they feel like they have a purpose and they show up every single Sunday. There's a kid, um, I'm not going to say his name, but he started coming with a friend and no one else in his family follows Jesus. No one. He does not have any support at home. And he started coming with a friend to church on Sunday mornings and he asked if he could help me. And I said, sure. And he started serving in our tech booth. And he was serving every single Sunday. Sometimes he would serve both services. He's in sixth grade at the time. And he was serving and serving and serving. And he was my main tech person. And it was so awesome to watch. And then COVID happened and he wasn't able to come regularly anymore. And he started to find a way to get to youth group. He had integrated into youth group and all of a sudden he was like figuring out a way, figuring a person to get him there. And remember his parents aren't, aren't doing it. They don't see the value of church, his siblings, and not that no one in his family bad. He just, they just aren't church people. They don't come. And so here's this 14 year old kid who's going to find a way to get to church so he can do what God has called him to do. And it's so beautiful to watch how, when we combine our love of Christ, with purpose and giving them purpose and value how they will find a way there. And I mean, that's one of my favorite stories because he's still coming and he still finds a way to get there. And I'm like, I wish so many adults could pull from that, you know, of understanding that level of commitment and purpose to drive. But when we're doing what we're called to do, it's, it's a joy. It's not a chore. Children are really incredible. I know that I've learned a lot through you because I don't have kids, but at harvest time specifically, like our outreach, I would say we're really focused on the family aspect of the community. And so I've learned a lot about kids that I didn't know before I came here. But as you were talking about that, I did write down something about like, and you were kind of explaining, but what is something about children that most people don't know? And like maybe how they learn or perceive things that people, I mean, like me before, I just was like, oh yeah, kids are kids. They're in their age group. I'm just going to leave them alone. Not that I didn't like them. I just didn't really understand them. And the more I interact with them, I'm like, oh, you, when I talk to you and I said this long sentence, you picked up that word and you ran with it. I just didn't understand how their brain worked. They have such special attributes that people might overlook just based on their age. But is there anything specifically that you've noticed you know, there's, oh my gosh, that's, that's a different podcast um, because there's so much information. One of the things that's really important to understand about kids is that most of what they believe morally, so their moral foundation and structure is solidified by the age of 13. So by the time a kid is 13, they have decided what is right, wrong, and morally okay. And if you think about a 13-year-old and the belief system that they have is going to guide them for the rest of their life, that's weighty. That's super weighty. And it's not that that can't change after that time, but the percentage goes down by more than two thirds of what the way that their brain can change and the way that their thoughts can. So that's why kids ministry is so important because most, I I believe it's 85% of people will make a decision to follow Christ before the age of 13. It goes down to, uh, I forget what the percentage changes, uh, 18 and under. Kyle would know that for sure. Um, But it's really hard after that for people to make a major change. And it's because your brain has solidified some certain things. And kids ministry, that's why it's so important. That's why we focus on the family too, because we want to equip parents to be able to know how to disciple their kids. And I, I can't tell you how many times parents are like, well, I just, I don't quite know how to tell them. The number one way to disciple your kids is to demonstrate it. You want your kids to read the Bible? Let them see you read the Bible. You want your kids to pray? Pray with them. Pray out loud. Let them hear you. And sometimes as parents, we are like, well, this is my quiet time. This is, I'm going to do this by myself. And instead of allowing our kids to join us during our quiet time and giving 
parameters. Like, okay, this is my time to talk to God. You're welcome to be here. So you can get your Bible out. You can draw. You can listen to worship music with us, but we're going to do that quietly in here so that we can worship God together, so that we can pray together. Well, this is where we're going to have to end this episode of The Secretary. There's a lot more ahead, though, so don't forget to tune in next time we release an episode. And thanks, as always, for listening, and we appreciate you, and we'll see you next time. Bum, 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 bum.